I guess one of the motivations for doing this research on the Wombat Forest for us was climatic changes. What role does climate change have? What impact does it have on forests? And how do forests uh, interact with, with changes in climate? So the first few slides really look into things that you're probably all very familiar with. Um, this one uh, here, for example, is the Australian temperature range. And you may have seen these images. So this is just the mean annual temperature changes that we find here in, uh, from 1910 to 2020. And if you look there very closely in the ones that sit in the front, so there's a benefit sitting at the front if you do, so you can read some of the slides, is that uh, we're, we're having a temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius over the mean average for the last 110 years there. And so that's one thing, it's getting warmer. Um, but the other thing is we also have more extreme heat events. And that's what this graph on the right hand side is about. Um, so we're getting more and more days when we actually have heat waves there. And so this next slide is a bit of a visualization of the temperature changes there. A um, bit difficult to see, but you know, the green colors, if it's green or beige, that's sort of a, a normal average temperature. If it gets into the redder and hotter and warmer colors, it indicates that it's a warmer year. And if it's a colder color in the blues means it's a colder year. And so if you compare this from going from 1910 to 2020, one thing is obvious, so, to me at least, you know, there's, there's not much going on in the first half of uh, the 20th century up until sort of here, 1960s. But then look at the, how the colors are changing, more from less green and more of the orangey and red colors there. So this is just effectively the same graph that we had before, but really showing now the continental extent of it's actually getting warmer. <laughs> and for us, it's rather tricky to find out as humans because we live in the now and it's hard to remember, well, was 2013, you know, 14, was that really a warm year or not? You don't really realize that. But these data and visualizations show us this. So that's warming, so it's getting warmer. What about rainfall? Is that really changing? And so there's this slide. Looks like a mess, right? Blue is getting wetter, red is, is a year when it wasn't as, as wet. And if you look at this in the same way, you can't really see a trend. I can't see a trend there, right? This is uh, you know, a drier year up here and there's a very wet year in 1956, remember that one? <laughs> it's very wet. Um, and so what we remember, remember that we had in the, um, in the southeast, we had the millennium droughts. If we just look at the Victorian corner down here, well, that's all red for about 10 years from 2001 to 2009. And then remember the floods that we had in Creswick and so on? Well, that's 2010 and 11. That's two years of La Nina years with over uh, uh, higher rainfalls. And so rainfall is very variable in the Australian context continentally. And so there isn't really a great signal there. But if we look just at the last few years, if we have certain areas, and here is southeastern Australia, so New South Wales and the eastern parts of Victoria, getting three years of low rainfall areas, then this is what's happening. Um, so if we get really a drying out forest, we have very dry fuels uh, and we get very hot conditions, we get fire conditions and these uh, massive bushfires that we've observed in 2020 uh, last year can happen. Um, so that's a consequence of variable rainfall. So we don't really have a lot of evidence that it's getting drier per se. But if we get a number of years when it gets drier and it gets hotter where we have evidence, then we get more bushfire conditions. So that's, that's real. So I thought I'd throw this in for all of us that live into the 2090s. <laughs> What's the weather in Ballarat going to be like? So there's a tool that you can get to the CSRO product. Uh, it's called Climate Analogs Explorer. And you can type in a city near you. And the closest I could find to Trentham was Ballarat. And then you can do some climate projections. And it tells you what's the climate going to be like in about uh, 60, 70 years from now in Ballarat like. It's going to be like Adelaide. It's going to be like Aubrey Wodonga or Wangaratta. So that you get an idea about what the conditions will be in about 70 years time. It's going to be a very different climate in Ballarat and so of course also in the region around here. And so what are the key threats from this climate change to forests is a question. Uh, on the one hand, we have the heat waves, right? That's sort of temperatures over the normal average, over 30 degrees for about four days in a row. 
Then, of course, we talked about droughts already, uh, that we have periods of time when we have low uh, rainfall or no rainfall. We have storms and storm damage that can come from this, not maybe so prevalent uh, here in Australia, and eucalypt forests are relatively resilient against those ones. But we have, of course, if we have heat waves and droughts and lack of rain, then we get fire danger. And fire can have a profound influence on, on many forest systems. And of course, we also can get changes in phenology if it's getting warmer and we don't have many frost days or not enough cooling days, then phenology changes means the time of flowering changes, if their pollination happens changes, if there's actually seeds in the forest changes, and if the seed can even germinate changes. So these are sort of secondary impacts from climate change on the succession of the forest. We're not going to talk much about it, but colleagues of mine have investigated this for eucalyptus forests, and there is evidence that that is changing the way that these forests can regenerate already. Um, and then, of course, we've got pests and diseases that are also sometimes favored by changes in climate because we will get more conditions that favor either insect attacks or fungal attacks uh, to forests. And so key questions for us is how do forests cope with these changes in climate? Are there forest systems that are more vulnerable uh, to changes in climate or are there forests uh, that are less vulnerable? Are they, are they more resilient? And, um, and specifically, when we started out our, our work in the Womet Forest that we've now doing for about 10 years, these are some of the key questions that we had is, is the Womet Forest actually a carbon sink? So does it take up carbon and when does it do it? Is it a continuous sink or are there times in the year or years, for example, when we have specific climatic events when there's not so much carbon coming in? Where is the biomass distributed in the forest? Is it all in the big trees? Is it in the small trees? Is it species specific? Uh, and what are the tree growth dynamics? When are trees growing? Are they all growing at the same time? Are they growing stems at the same time and height at different times? And we didn't really know much about it. And then I threw a few slides in from my colleague, Ren Bennett, who's done, uh, and Kevin Tolos, who've done work on fire impacts. So what does fire and prescribed burning in specifically, what's that impact? have on, on the biomass in the forest. So just a map of the sites that we work with. Um, this is the tower that we have here is the one that flux site uh, that Gail talked about. Uh, and then we've established a number of uh, so what we call climate gradient sites here, which are these dots. So Trentham would be around here. And then we've got a site near Dalesford. Then going into this part of the one forest down to out of the Walmart forest here to Mount Edgerton and then in the Brisbane Ranges, we had a third one. So that we have a rainfall gradient, so we could study the forest species along a rainfall gradient to see, well, how does it actually adjust to these changes in rainfall uh, across a very similar temperature <coughs> gradient there. And so the Walmart forest flux station that we have, you can see that here is part of one of 12 what they call super sites of the terrestrial ecosystem research network. So it's a federally funded research infrastructure that does ecosystem monitoring across Australia. And they do this in three tiers. The first one is tier continental scale monitoring with satellites where they fly satellites and they take information um, from, from the landscapes. The second one is what they call ecosystem surveillance. This is a thousand plots across the landscape. We don't have them on this map here. Um, but they are put everywhere just to have assessments about the biodiversity, what plant species are growing there, what animals are there. And then we have these ones here, which these, uh, this blue scale, which is a finer scale monitoring. That's what we call ter terrestrial ecosystem research network, ecosystem processes, and the Walmart flux tower is one of those. So uh, they investigate in more detail how the ecosystem functions over time. And the beauty about this is a long-term project that's been now going on with funding for about 10 years and we have at least funding for another three years with uh, <laughs> we're always hopeful that that funding will be continued. So where exactly is the one that flux site and what does it look like? Uh, we're here in Trentham, there's Delsford, here's Leonard's Hill and if you drive from Leonard's Hill um, towards the west you can sort of towards Barkstead uh, on a dirt road you can turn off the uh, white flat road and on that road just when you hit Walmart Station Track, that's where the Flux Tower is. More than welcome to go and visit it. It's a fenced compound, so you can't really go in there. And if you wish and you want to have a field trip at some point, we can surely do that again. Uh, we do that quite often. And we're more than, more than happy to have a, another tour of the site and, and uh, 
show you what, what else is going on other than the flux tower. This forest usually has about three different species. Um, so Eucalyptus obliqua or mesmate stringy bark is the most prevalent one, about 50 to 60 percent of all the trees in our uh, little patch around the one with flux tower is obliqua. And then um, narrowly peppermint, Eucalyptus radiata, that's the sort of least abundant there, is about 10 percent of the trees in there. And then uh, Eucalyptus rubida or candle bark, that's about 20 to 30 percent of the trees in the forest are, are this species. That's the dominant eucalyptus species that we have in this forest. And of course, you know all the rest of it. It's a median open tall forest, and the climate is cool temperate. And uh, yeah, really great soils in the Wombat Forest, <laughs> very clay and hard to work with. So, this tower that we built there, this 35 meter, what we call eddy covariance tower has instruments on it that measures the exchange of carbon dioxide in and out of the forest and with the atmosphere. So it has sensors here at the top that measure the CO2 concentration and it also has sensors that measure the wind direction. And from these two informations, we can then estimate how much carbon is actually going into the system and at what times and how much carbon is coming out of the system. And the sensors also measure water exchange so we can measure how much the, uh, the whole forest is transpiring and how much water it is losing. So just gives you a rough overview. Here's some, uh, some finer uh, images of what the sensors look like. But let's go to the first results slide. And it's going to be, oh my god, so many lines. So I'll do this, try to do this slowly. Uh, we've got a green line, a red line, and a blue line there. So the green line is the photosynthetic uptake of the carbon from the atmosphere. So that's really photosynthesis that the flux tower is measuring. And it shows us that's the CO2 going into the forest. Um, and you can see that there is an annual variation and it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. That's just the seasons. And uh, what we can see here, the highest photosynthetic uptake we always get in the middle of summer or in the summer months. And that's because we have the greatest energy input from the sun. So the sun is giving the energy to the leaves and the leaves can then take that energy, convert it by taking up CO2 into sugars and the sugars into uh, biomass eventually. The red line now, that's the loss of carbon or respiration uh, that the trees are doing. We're all sitting here having had lunch and we're respiring, giving off CO2 into this room. And in about half an hour's time, we all get very sleepy because the CO2 concentration gets so high. And trees do exactly the same thing. They also respire because they have normal metabolism where they have to repair themselves, move things around, defend themselves. And so this is this red line. And you can see there's a substantial amount of carbon that's going out back into the atmosphere from the trees. But the blue line, that's sort of your net balance and how much carbon actually is remaining in the ecosystem. And if the blue line is under the zero line here, we have carbon uptake because the photosynthetic inputs are greater than the respiration losses. And what we can see here for a time from 2010 to 2020, the median blue line is always under the zero line. And that means the Womit forest is always taking up carbon. Not every day. You can see some of these sort of blue spikes here. So there are days or weeks when we're losing a bit more carbon than we're taking up. But in general, the Womit forest is a very strong carbon sink, and it's also a continuous carbon sink. Greater in the summer months, because we have so much more photosynthetic input, um, than it is in, in the other months. So in winter, it's less of a carbon sink, but it's not like many deciduous forest systems that don't have leaves in winter. And then of course they have no carbon input whatsoever, but then only losses into the ecosystem. So they always go through these cycles of, you know, high uptake in the summer and then losses in the winter. And so you can come into situations when deciduous forests or other forests that are stressed for some reasons are not carbon sinks all the time. The Walmart forest is different. It's a continuous carbon sink, always has been for the last 10 years, regardless of what kind of weather you throw at it. So it's a very healthy, strong growing forest. So the question I can see it on your faces is now, does it grow all the time at the same rate? And the answer for this is no. There are quite substantial differences between years. So this is now a graph that shows us the cumulative carbon uptake. So we start here at zero at January 1st, and then we end up Okay, how much carbon have we taken up for the year than in December 31st? And you can see on average, you know, it's sort of between the lowest was, was six tons per hectare in 2013. 
And the highest we had here, that was in actually in 2012. So two years apart, we have doubled the carbon input into the, into the warm mid forest there. Um, just the 2012, probably reaped the benefits from the two very wet La Nina years, and it wasn't as cloudy as it was, but the forest had a big influx of, of, of water storages below ground. In 2013, we had some heat waves at the wrong time of the year, and we actually had leaf damage there, and so there wasn't as much carbon uptake. But on average, it's a very strong carbon sink for most of the time, most of the years. So then we were interested in, okay, well, what's, what's the biomass like and where does it sit and how much biomass do we have? So we went out and did uh, forest inventories around our flux tower. And the forest inventory uh, flux tower is here, and this is 30 plots that we did. And that's an image of one plot. So you put an 11-meter radius tape or 22-meter diameter uh, circle into the forest, and you measure all the trees that are in there. And from this, you can then add other metric equations, and you can work out how much carbon or biomass is in the forest. So first thing that we looked at, how many live trees do we have and how many dead trees do we have? And there's a big difference there. Unfortunately, walnut forests being very healthy, most of the biomass is actually in the, in the live trees, not in the dead ones. Um, and then we were also interested in sort of the, the classes of forests that we have. And you can take any tree that you have in the forest and you can put it into four different classes. One is a, are the dominant trees. So these are the, the trees that are big canopies and they're overshadowing everything else. Co-dominant trees that sort of are within the dominant ones, but they're, they also have very big and healthy canopies. Then the ones that are intermediate, so they're slightly shaded by the other trees. And then you have the suppressed trees, which are often the small ones that sit in the forest, and they're overshaded by everybody else. And as we can see, healthy distribution that most of the carbon is actually in the dominant and co-dominant trees, and the suppressed ones, the tiny strugglers, actually only have about 10% of the biomass in the walnut forest around the flux tower patch. And so then we were interested in more into, well, okay, look at the size classes because does it really de depend on the diameter of the tree? And the diameter is really the girth of the tree around breast height. So when we have here and then the measures there, this is zero, less than, than 10 centimeters, so about that size. That's the small trees that you find in any forest when you walk around. And there's lots of them. But how much carbon is in there? 0.3% of all the biomass is in the tiny trees in the one minute forest. So any tree that's you know, smaller than sort of my arm here, less than 10 centimeters, they just don't have any biomass whatsoever. There might be lots of them, but they just don't hold any carbon and any, any biomass. And really, you know, the 10 to 20 centimeters and 20 centimeter tree is about that big. So it's, it's already reasonably substantial. That also holds only about 8.5% of the, of the carbon in the forest. And so really the bulk of the carbon is in the larger trees in the walnut forest. And that's where you would want them as well, because these are the trees that are less likely to be impacted by disturbances such as fire. And they're also probably more likely to survive extreme events such as droughts. And so then we were interested in the growth processes. And when do these trees grow and do they all grow differently? Or do they grow, uh, do they grow uh, the same way? And so we had diameter tape. So this is steel bands that you put around the, the trunk of a tree. And then you have the spring in there. And you have two slides that slide against each other. And from this, you can see sort of the slide moving very slowly. And you come back every month. And you take a reading there. You can then see how the tree is growing. And two things are quite obvious. One, yeah, they're always growing to some degree. But they're growing differently. So the three species actually have very different growth rates. And the best growing ones is mesmate stringy bark and the candle bark here. And the worst growing one is the radiata, the peppermint. So that's one thing. The peppermint just doesn't grow very well. And there's not a lot of it in the area where we work, probably for that reason. And the other one is that you can see it's not a straight line. So they're not always growing. And there are times of the year when it goes, you know, flat. And then it grows again and flat and grows again and flat. And if you take that out, you find that the stem's circumference is really growing mainly in the spring and in the autumn and in winter, but not in summer. So I have always this pattern for most of the trees, grows for most of the year, and then in summer you get a flat line. And then it grows for most of the year, and then it flatlines again. And so initially we thought, well, it's clear. It's drought stress. What else can it be? But it isn't. <laughs> it's not drought stress. And we've seen this from the flux tower data, because from this we could see, well, we actually have continuous carbon uptake. So where does the carbon go? 
Well, these trees don't only have to grow girth, they also have to grow up. And that's what they do in summer. So in the summer months is actually when you find the height growth. And so we could measure this with some laser scanners that we had. So we'd you know, sort of do a 360 in the forest uh, every day for about three years. And with these laser scanners, we could detect that the canopy is actually moving. And it's mainly moving in the three summer months. And that's also the time when we have the highest turnover of leaves. So we get the biggest litter fall also in the summer months. It's not necessarily related to drought stress because then we get new leaves at the same time. So the leaf area throughout the year really is very, very stable in this forest. So if you want to sum this up, in the Womit forest, the fat trees are the ones that are really winning because they're the ones that have the most biomass. And they grow stems in autumn, winter, and spring, most in autumn and spring, but a little bit in winter as well. And in summer, they really shoot up and put new canopy on, new leaves, and they also grow height. Whereas the little trees, and the pool of peppermint doesn't really grow much at all. Um, the smaller the trees are, really the less they grow at all, and that's why they really don't put in so much biomass there. Right, so that's the growth dynamics, and that gave us a very good idea about, you know, Wormat Forest and the patch where we have the flux tower is a really healthy forest. It's not very stressed. There's no sign of drought stress in, these, uh, in that patch. We looked at the water fluxes as well. I didn't show you the data, but, you know, it's very clear that even if we have heat waves, they can transpire a lot, and that's important for a tree if it gets very warm, that it can cool itself down. That's what it does with the transpiration, and so they do this. So I thought I'll, I'll talk a little bit about fire and impact of prescribed burning. And my colleague and now retired, Kevin Tolhurst, who used to also work at Creswick um, at the forestry school, set up an experiment that's called the uh, WOMED Fire Effect Study Area, FISA. And he has five sites that he set up here in Kangaroo Creek, Burn Bridge, Musk Creek, Blakewell, and Barkstead, where they had five different treatments. And one of it is a control, and you can see that for the Blakeville site here, this is a patch of the forest, it's a control that's never been burned. And it has not been burned since 1935. So completely unburned forest. And then he had patches of forest that were burned in spring every three years, or in autumn every three years or they were burned in spring every 10 years, or in autumn every 10 years. So this is a pres prescribed burn, the ones that, uh, that DELP does every now and then, and particularly now, this time of the year, will come back up again. And so it's quite interesting to see what does it do to the biomass of the forest. We have other researchers in our school that looked at things like biodiversity and how does it impact these things, because these change the structure if you burn the understory, but what does it do to the trees? And that's what's shown in this slide by my colleague, Ren Bennett. Um, so here we have fire frequency, and this is the control trees and how much uh, biomass is in there. So just over 320 uh, tons of carbon per hectare is in there. And we can see that if we have a lower uh, intensity fire frequency, so three times burn in 30 years, we have slightly lower biomass in this forest. If we burn more frequently, it's even lower. But the average, difference is only about 15%. So the absolute magnitude of reduction of biomass by burning the forest is significant statistically, but it's not really substantial in that the biomass would half. 15% less biomass is really a small proportion of biomass, and that's across the board. So they measured everything from large stems, small stems, soil, carbon, and, and the lot, and that's what they find. So prescribed burning and you wouldn't really burn a forest every three years, but that's sort of the extreme that they went to of burning it, does reduce the carbon standing biomass. All right, summary for this part is, well, so Wormit Forest is a strong carbon sink, right? So it's, it's always taking up carbon most of the year. Uh, there's no evidence really for water limitation, at least at the site where we work. Um, most of the biomass is in the uh, medium-sized trees, small trees really not very significant uh, in terms of, of keeping carbon in the forest. Um, large trees grow all year round with a stem growth and height growth difference there, that height mainly in summer months. And repeated burning does reduce the forest biomass, but not really to a big extent. All right, that's sort of a carbon story, but part of me, you know, I'm a bit of a sadist because I'm interested in what, how trees suffer <laughs> when they're stressed. And so this is some things that we observed in the in the last years. We can see parts of Australia, in this case, in the Jarrah Forest in WA. 
There are patches of trees that have died. We can find this uh, stringy bark forest in Long, uh, Longwood, not so far away from here in the Strathbogie Ranges. You know, large parts of the forest completely brown in the summer months. Um, that's near Seymour here, an entire uh, western facing edge of a, of a forest, also brown, completely dead, killed not by fire. It looks a bit like fire disturbance, but it is not. It's drought disturbance there. The same thing in Port Macquarie, New South Wales, or here, just an individual tree in a paddock. And so, top left hand corner, that's the published studies about tree drought mortality that we find in the scientific literature. It's only a handful. Contrast this with this graph here, map of Australia, and lots and lots of dots. In fact, over 350 observations. This is a citizen science project that my colleague Belinda Medlin has started, and I would urge you <laughs> to contribute to it if you can. So if you find a dead tree somewhere, anywhere in the forest, take a picture, go to this webpage, Dead Tree Detective, and upload it with a georeference. Maybe tell them what species it is if you know. And if you don't know, don't worry. Just upload the picture and we have a record of it. Because it's important that we have citizen scientists like you going out in the forest and actually telling other scientists where there is a dead tree, or there's five dead trees, or there's 10 or 20, because otherwise we will not know about it. And if we want to know more about the impacts of climatic changes on the forest, we need to know where these things happen. And as we can see, that's the impact of the drought that we had in the last three years on the East Coast, particularly New South Wales and Southern Queensland. It's quite substantial. And in Victoria, we also have more and more observations of trees dying. So that doesn't mean that there's more tree death. It just means that we observe it probably to a greater extent because we have now the dead tree detective. So questions that we then had is what's the drought impact on Wormed forest tree species? What are the key responses of the trees to drought? How did they deal with drought in, in the first instance? Does it, you know, how, how do they deal with it? And are there differences between tree species and provenances? Um, so we did this in a number of different experiments. And I'm not showing a lot of you know, graphs at this time, I'll just try to summarize this because it's a rather complex topic. So the one hand we had our environmental gradient, so the drought gradient that I talked earlier about from you know, Dalesford down to the Brisbane Ranges here with different species. And then we did the same thing for different populations of Eucalyptus obliqua, Mesmet stringy bark, because that's the tree species that we, well, it's the most dominant one in the patch of, of forest, of warmed forest where we work. And so we were interested in what that does. We collected then seeds from these, uh, from these trees in the wild, put them back to the Burnley campus and actually run experiments there with them to see, do they behave in the same way like the ones that are out in the forest? Then we had a rainfall exclusion experiment that we set up here at Leonard's Hill in a patch of, of regrowth forest, put out these gutters in the forest to intercept about 50% of the rainfall. So we would really stress the trees that are, that are there in this little patch. And then we also did a, a drought stress experiment with Eucalyptus obliqua where we, yeah, we really tried to see, can we teach these trees to become more drought tolerant? And I'll show you what, what I mean with this. So first thing, maybe just a, a bit of science here is what happens when a drought event comes along? What happens to these? The first thing is that the water status of the tree is declining. So it's not as well watered. And you can see this maybe with your tomato plants at home, that sometimes on very warm days, they get a bit limp like that. And that's the water potential in the plant declining and it doesn't, it's not really fully turgescent and it's getting a bit limp. That's water potential decreases. So trees usually uh, then close their little holes that they have in their leaves that enable the gas exchange and they call them stomata. They close them, right, to conserve water. That means stomata are closed, no more CO2 can come in, photosynthesis declines. And then they have what we call turbo adjustment. So they're turning their remaining carbon into osmolites to help the tree to become a bit more drought tolerant and weather this sort of decrease in, in the amount of water that's in the, in the tree. And then eventually they start shedding leaves. So they're dropping leaves because they really need to control the amount of water loss because even if the stomata are close, there's still water escaping the tree. And then eventually, if this doesn't help, you get embolisms in the uh, vessels that are going through the stem uh, in the tree. And this is what then starts eventually killing the trees, right? So you get an embolism in there. It's like when we have a stroke, uh, there's an air bubble that develops in a xylem vessel. That's where the water is transported through these vessels up the trunk. And if the uh, water deficit is too big, 
just develops an air bubble and then that vessel can no longer transport water upstairs. And so they're running effectively out of water because they have too many embolisms in the stem. And if there's too many of them, too many of these vessels damaged, then the tree has irreversible tissue damage and it dies. And so what we can do now is we can measure some parameters with scientific instruments. For water potential uh, decrease, we can measure the so-called water potential with pressure chambers. Uh, so uh, conductance we can measure with an instrument called an infrared gas analyzer. So photosynthesis. So we can measure when the stomatas are closing or how photosynthesis is impacted. The osmotic or turgo adjustment we can measure with something that's called a uh, PV curve, and I'm <laughs> not going to bother explaining that because it'll take me 10 minutes. Um, the shedding of leaves is something that actually not that difficult to measure because we just measure the amount of trees per branch. So we take branches, we measure the size, and we can count how many leaves are on them. You can find that some of them have more leaves per branch and some of them have less leaves per branch. And then the hydraulic vulnerability or the xylem vulnerability, this is a, an image here of uh, developed embolism. So this is xylem vessels now cut like that. So this is a tree stem and we cut it like this, look on top of it. If it's dark, there's an embolism there. Water cannot be transported. And we can measure the time or the, the pressure at which this happens. And then eventually we can also calculate mortality in, in the forest. Okay, um, so we looked at the environmental gradient in the first instance. So we went to all these sites and the ones that we actually have, an, have a symbol here. That's the type of things that we measured when we went to these sites. Five sites in the, in the forest. Um, and that's the outcome there. So if we look at the wetter sites there, they actually had the trees and the provenances of Eucalyptus oblico, they had a better water status there. And the drier sites, they had a worse water status. Not really that surprising. Uh, because, you know, the rainfall gradient, that's about 500 millimeters from 1,000 to about 500 millimeters. So if you're in a dry environment, you're also not that well watered, effectively. But if you look at the drought tolerance, it means that the trees that are growing on the wetter end, they're not as drought tolerant as the trees that are at the drier end. So that's a good thing, right? Because these trees have already adjusted or adapted to the drier conditions. And the same is true for the drought vulnerability. So this is your embolisms. These trees are easier to embolize than these ones down here. And this was the same for the species, but also for the different provenances of, of Eucalyptus obliqua. The ones that are growing in wetter environments also have more leaves per branch. So if you're, if you're in a drier area, you actually have less leaves per branch. And interestingly, you also have smaller leaves. So if you're Eucalyptus obliqua, stringy bark messmate, that grows in a drier area, you always have slightly smaller leaves than if you grow in a wetter area. Um, so then we took these seeds, grow them in the glass house, that's how it looked like, and we looked at the same uh, parameters again. And we could find out that these uh, drought vulnerabilities, so when uh, xylem is embolizing, or when it really has this catastrophic embolism that the trees are killed by, that is genetically controlled, and so is the leaf size. So this, what we call traits, have been passed on from generation to generation within different populations of the same species. Whereas these other elements here, they're all driven by the environment. So this is important because this one is fixed, right? That's genetically. That's what your genes tell you. Whereas this one here is always controlled by the environmental condition, whether it gets drier or whether it gets wetter and so on and so forth. And so then we did this stress experiment by having the rain out shelters there. And you can see them up from a satellite imagery here. There's three of them there. And so we had three sites where we had 50% of the rainfall excluded and three sites where we just had a normal control and we measured all the trees in there. And the outcome was slightly disappointing because we didn't find anything. <laughs> there was no stress really. For three years we sent a poor PhD student out there to get there before dawn take leaf samples, measure how stressed the trees were. And only once in the season we found that they were actually stressed. And the ones that we excluded rainfall from, they were not stressed more than the other ones. So it was, it was very frustrating for Corolla, but it's published so you can find it in the literature. Uh, not a very exciting study to you know, go through all this effort of putting these gutters into the rainfall, cleaning them, repairing them, and then you don't find any stress. But the good news is that the trees are very resilient, right? Because they are not really uh, there's so much rain there at Leonard's Hill that they're not getting stressed. 
And then we had the idea of doing an experiment to see, can we train the trees to become more drought tolerant, right? So, uh, so we had, this is a setup that we had at Burnley, so big planter bags with uh, little uh, messmates in them. And then these were already six months old. And then we watered them for about nine months. And the well watered ones, they were always watered constantly. Every three days they get water. And the ones here that we call drought conditions, they weren't watered as much. So they received less water and we stressed them. And then we watered them again, and then we stressed them, and then we watered them again. So that went on for nine months, and you would think, okay, well, does that really make a difference? Because if it does, that's a good thing, right? Because then you can find out that a tree can become either more drought tolerant, or can it learn to become more drought tolerant. So what was the outcome there? Well, the drought conditioning did not really change the tolerance of the tree, so that it actually didn't become more drought tolerant. It didn't change any of the physiological parameters. It didn't change the anatomical parameters. It didn't change the, the vessel size of the, of, of, um, of, of the xylem. It didn't change when they imploded. Um, but the drought conditioning did influence the morphology of the tree. And so it means the amount of leaves they have and how big they were. And because the ones that we drought stressed or drought conditioned were smaller and had less leaves, they lived longer. But that was really the only thing that changed. So this was a positive in some ways because we now know what the trees can actually do when they're constantly stressed. They just lose leaves and they grow less. They're smaller, therefore they're losing less water. But the sad thing is we cannot teach these trees to become more drought tolerant because the tolerance is more or less genetically fixed in these trees and doesn't really change with the environment. So if we're having a continuously becoming drier and hotter environment, the tolerances and the points at which a tree will die does not change. And that, of course, is a problem because the tree doesn't change. The only mechanism it has is lose leaves. That's the only thing it can do and you know, control water loss. But it can't really become more drought tolerant. So just a sort of summary of this is if we have a more arid environment, this is sort of, we get small vessel, uh, xylem vessels. So this is the transporting organisms in the stem where the water flows through. And because the water, because they're so small, the water transport there is very slow. And the slow water transport means that we can only support very small leaves or not enough leaves. And then we also have a very small leaf area and because there's not so many leaves, we don't really get a lot of carbon gain and the trees by itself are relatively short. And if you go and look at eucalypts, how they actually, too much, how high they can grow over a gradient, you'll find in the Mali, they only grow about five meters. Why? Because they have so little water, because they have all of this. But if you go into wetter environments, you'll find the opposite, right? So you get wide vessel sizes. And like you know, if you have a straw and you have a very narrow straw, suck through it, very hard to suck the water up. But you have a very wide straw, it's very easy. And so this enables them faster water transport. They make larger leaves and they can have more leaf area and therefore they grow more and therefore they can grow taller. And that's true for most eucalypts. If you put them through a line and you look at that, rainfall versus height or rainfall versus leaf area, that's how it looks. But these things are genetic, right? So they are fixed in, it doesn't change with the environment. And therein lies the problem uh, of the, the drought adaptation really um, is limited because these genetic changes will take a long time. Let's finish up with a summary. Where are we? What does it all mean? Um, so we have the trees of the Wombat Forest. They're not yet severely damaged by droughts. That's the summary of the drought, the drought story here. Um, that's because we have sufficient rainfall. We have relatively high rainfall, and we have well-adapted species for the environment. Um, so physiological and morphological adjustments is what we can see, but they're small scale. They're not really leading to sort of fundamental changes. We all can also see that we probably have a limited adaptive capacity of the trees. And that's because a lot of the fundamentals that make a tree drought tolerant or vulnerable are genetically fixed in the tree and doesn't really change with the environmental conditions, right? So drought tolerance and drought vulnerability in these trees is inherent. It's not something that you can influence. We also find that provinces show local adaptation, and that means that there's differences whether you have an obliqua or probably a radiata. We didn't look at that. We only looked at this in Mesmate. If it grows in a very dry area, it is actually already different 
uh, from its uh, anatomy and from its, some of its physiological parameters compared to one that grows in three or four or 500 millimeters more rainfall. So genetics have already moved into this. These, these trees have adapted to it. And the sad thing is drought tolerance cannot be learned by the trees. It is passed on from generation to generation. And these are very slow changes. So eucalypts in general have relatively narrow climatic ranges. That's why there's so many of them. There's about 900 different eucalyptus species. And if you look at them, obliqua nesmate stringy bark is probably the exception because it has actually a very wide range. But many other eucalypts have very narrow bands, temperature ranges in which they exist, and also rainfall ranges in which they exist. Um, and so it means that they possibly have a limited capacity to adapt to rapid changes in climate change, or in climate change that we have. And so far, we haven't really experienced this. As we can see from the first slides, you know, the temperature is ramping up, rainfall is really different. But predictions of climate change is that it is becoming more extreme, and the temperature is increasing, and we're getting more of these extreme events of rainfalls two or three years when we don't really have a lot of rainfall, then it becomes problematic. So then the options are really limited, what you have, and more than happy to discuss this because I know you're very passionate about the Womad Forest and also about the, nation, the national park potentially. But if, it, if you have a national park, of course, your management options are rather limited. If you don't have a national park, you can do thinning, you can do species selection, you can introduce species that are possibly more drought tolerant because you know they're more drought tolerant. If you have a national park, you don't. And on this controversial note, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions.